Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the Philippines Institute for Development Studies for successfully organizing this policy forum with, the, with a very timely team. PIDS has proven once again that it is rightly called a think tank. In fact, a think tank that informs, guides, and influences the nation's policy discussions. And uh, thanks to PIDS for inviting me here. And it's also nice to see old friends, old acquaintances, and all the partners in, the, in development in the country. Second, I'd also like to congratulate the three presenters for their enlightening take on the proposed uh, federalization of the country. The three papers nicely complement each other and all together contribute to the clarification of the various complex issues, remind us of the realities of the ground, and how we may start thinking about reconfiguring the country's economic, spatial, and governance uh, setup. Now I will discuss the three papers around five questions for which the answers I think at least some of us here would want to take away from a forum like this. At the onset, let me say these questions are my preferences and they are not necessarily the most important or interesting to policymakers. Also, the three papers have other merits beyond those answers they provide to my own questions. Also, it is likely that these questions were already answered in the morning session, which unfortunately I wasn't able to, to attend. So the first question is, what is federalism? How is that different from decentralization or devolution? By beginning with the need for definitions, I of course betray my being a teacher, but it's often useful to have a common understanding of the terms that we use. Here, Chuck Manasson's paper differentiates the two succinctly. Decentralization involves the transfers of powers or responsibilities that the national government decides to delegate or see to LGUs. Federalism involves the division of power and responsibilities as stipulated in the Constitution or as the sovereign people has, has directly decided. So the takeaway here is that federalism is much more permanent or durable and therefore harder to amend or to reverse. Now, if there's any lesson that we learn in our many failed attempts to revise local government, the local government code of 1995 in the last 25 years, is that we should get the objectives and details of the reform right at the very beginning. Amending a flawed reform later will be extremely difficult. We've had experiences like this in the past 25 years. If the code is hard to amend, surely amending the Constitution will not be a walk in the park. Second question, what powers and responsibilities should be assigned to the national government and to the sub-national governments, meaning LGUs as we know them, and the states or state governments on top of the LGUs. Here again, Chad's paper is very useful. It reminds us of the economic principles for the assignment of expenditure and revenue raising powers between the different layers of government and how a higher level government, for example, the national government of the state, will coordinate the various behaviors or activities of the lower, level, lower levels of government if they are found one thing. Okay, so far so good. Third, how will the states be configured? Here the paper by Chat and Ron and partner take the proposed states by Senator Pimentel or the PDP Lalan party and ask the questions whether these are administratively or politically viable. Chat estimates how much it would cost to have an extra layer of government, the state government. By putting a figure there, we can now ask the question of whether the extra 55 billion or so that we will be working out is better spent this way than say for infrastructure, health, or education. So I think it's part of the details that we need to have before some numbers that we can, you know, we can, uh, we can evaluate. Ron's paper reminds us that well, guns, goons, and goals are everywhere in the three proposed states that they evaluated in the paper. And that same guns, goons, and gold may yet frustrate again the hope for regional development under a federal setup. I won't be surprised if the same three Gs will be found in other proposed states as well. Of the three papers, Art's paper take us further in answering the question I posed. His approach reminds me of a point a German scholar made in a previous forum about why federalism works in Germany. He said it is because they have economic decentralization. 
which means that Germany has many highly developed regional economies. Without such regional economies, all of Germany might be subservient to their own quote-unquote imperial Berlin or Bonn. Arts exercise has the same end goal. Beginning with the CBD, what would be the external boundaries of the state that would be economically viable using population as indicator of economic potential as well as the presence of living firms? His most optimistic findings do not coincide with the proposed configuration of states. If there are only two or three viable states per uh, arts uh, exercise, do we really need to federalize? Art mentioned of extending his model. Maybe he may consider the following extensions. Tax revenue potentials. The idea is that component LGUs can raise a substantial portion of the revenues from local sources. Otherwise, they will be dependent again on Imperial Manila. Of course, the tax revenue potentials will depend on the types and range of functions that will be assigned to states and subnational governments. This is uh, Chad's uh, point. Second is that how do we maximize agglomeration economies as we reconfigure the states? CBDs are CBDs, growth areas are growth areas because people and firms find it beneficial to locate together. They will try to do with or without government intervention. And so, it is important to take existing and potential agglomeration economies in deciding distinct boundaries. I, 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 I am with Art's uh, problem of you know, lacking uh, some national data sets to assess the existing agglomeration economies. But it has to be said yeah, that that should be part of the criteria in deciding how, how we, can, we should reconfigure the state boundaries. The third possible extension is that just to post the guns, goons, and gold that Ron was mentioning in his paper in the putative or configured states. The idea is what we might as is that we might as well anticipate the emerging political economy in, the, in these states. There's no use empowering these states if they end up only being captured by the usual political elites. Another uh, possible extension or uh, consideration in arts modeling is the demographic characteristics of the population. Yes, some of this already, but besides economic viability, including economies of scale, which favor bigger states, the state should also be more or less populated with the people of similar preferences for public goods. I think this is the lesson that we have learned in the uh, at least in the theory of fiscal federalism. Unfortunately, this, this consideration of homogeneous uh, preferences for public services favors small states. So you have a tension there between economies of scale, which, which favors large uh, states, versus homogeneity of preferences for public goods of preferences, which favor small states. So another, another uh, possible consideration is a fiscal equity or fiscal equalization grant. While we want the LGUs in a state to be self-reliant, which means, in the context of the Philippines, less dependent on the internal revenue allotment, there will always be fiscal inequities. That will be in inevitable in a federal setup. This is a chance point about fiscal equity, where fiscal equalization grants uh, come in. We could learn from the experience of other countries like Australia or Canada, I believe, in this, in this aspect. They have, uh, they have very good uh, grants of this part. So to paraphrase, to paraphrase chats, to chat, chat, sorry, arts modeling exercise will be an iterative process until the ideal number of states are identified. Uh, nonetheless, art should be commended for making the initial effort, but it won't, it's not the last, uh, it's not the last uh, iteration yet. Yeah, but, uh, we, we should consider other dimensions. My fourth question, my fourth question is, how do we get there? Or how do we amend the Constitution or the LGC to get to the federal setup, assuming we have agreed on the design? What do we do if we get derailed or we're not headed in this, in this desired direction, even after we implemented the, the, the new Constitution or the new law? These questions are more about the political economy of reform. It has been raised before by Matsuda of the World Bank, for example, that the LGC is taking some time to amend and the reason why the LGC is taking some time to amend is because the legislators will not amend something that will empower their local political opponents. I think it is safe to assume that some of our incumbent legislators will be motivated the same. They will configure the states in the governance setup in their favor. So what do we do? 
I think this is what this is where we can learn from other disciplines, so political scientists, for example, have found a way of dividing the, uh, you know, the, the political power such that unity is more favored than, uh, than uh, disunity. Uh, I don't know, uh, proportional representation perhaps, or political party, and, and the like. Now, even if we have that in place, what if we get derailed? Or what if the empowered states or LGUs are captured? Saved by political dynasties for those with guns, goods, and gold. Yeah, the, the intent of the code or the constitution or the federal law may not be what is going to be implemented because the realities on the ground is that it is hard to ensure that the objectives are, uh, are met. Here, both Chad and Ron underscored the need for accountability. To ensure that the LGUs are answerable to their constituents, I would say that ensure that people are able to vote with their hands, vote with their wallets, and vote with their feet. Vote with their hands as exercise of choice to election ballots. This is the usual expression of support or opposition to a political candidate or political platform. Vote with their wallets when they cross border to shop and get a better value for their heart and money. Yeah, they, that should be promoted. If the local government is not doing anything about local businesses, they, the constituents should not be prohibited from shopping elsewhere to get the most value for their heart and hard earned money. And the last one is vote with their feet. This is when they migrate elsewhere in their LGUs fail them. Besides electoral or political reforms, there are structural interventions that should remain the national government's responsibility. The provision of public infrastructures to enable physical mobility across states, and the provision of health and education services to enhance and secure the capabilities of the population. Meaning, capabilities are something that they can take with them wherever they choose to locate, and they are not dependent on their local government uh, provision. If you recall, the LGC has provision about mandatory review, I think every five years. We have had several attempts at this through the years, but the code remains largely as is, despite everybody's view that it must be revised. Again, it remains as it is because the reform process to get, to get, it, uh, to get the reform process initiated and completed is derailed by political, uh, political capture. The lesson then is what provision in the federal con constitution or federal law should there be such that reviewing and or amending it becomes credible. Will it be possible to have a sunset clause, for example, that says like, unless such and such provision is reaffirmed five years from now, then it will be automatically amended as such. Then it will be, you know, then they will be compelled to take the report or the review process more seriously than what we have now in the local government code. Okay, I think I think that is that is needed because we cannot anticipate all the potential problems that might arise in the future. So what should be in the law or in the constitution is the reform mechanism for it to be seriously undertaken. I think that is what is missing in the local uh, local government code. And finally, the last question is, do we really need to federalize? I caught only the tail end of the uh, open discussion in the morning session, where answers to this question were advanced and challenged. So I may just be repeating what has been tackled with what I'm going to say. Anyway, here's what I think uh, are the more salient reasons provided. First. It is the Duterte government's campaign promise and now the government policy. I can't think of a better quip here than to quote or paraphrase Secret Secretary Benjamin Jocko, who said, differentiate the Duterte as, as candidate from the Duterte as the president. What I mean is that the Duterte, the president, now surely has more information, different vantage point, and faced with more interlocutors than he was accustomed in Davao. That he might be more open-ended now about to, to discuss about the pros and cons of federalism. 
So I, I'm not I'm not saying he's, he's, he already has his mindset to it, but we can probably still convince him if we have uh, enough um, arguments for or against. The other excuse is that federalism can promote a more balanced regional development or reduce poverty. This claim is very loaded, and it seems to, to suggest two channels by which federalism can reduce growth imbalances or poverty. The first is that local officials know the poor and therefore are in a better position to directly provide for them. Two things, though, on my studies of decentralization in the country come to mind. Much of the LGU provisions for the poor is short-term redistributive transfers. Perang tulong para sa kasal, binyag, at living. Very difficult is for development uh, projects. These transfers will surely temporarily alleviate poverty because if you measure poverty as just an income, you know, a shortfall from the poverty threshold, if you give them income, surely the threshold, the, the, the shortfall will be, uh, will be, will be lower. But that, is, but that will not truly solve the poverty, poverty problem. Okay, there's also future needs or clientelist transfers. That is, while the, LGU, while the LGUs may know the poor and provide for them, the problem is that they cannot say no to the non-poor, who may crowd out the poor from the limited public provisions. We've seen evidence of this, for example, in the, uh, in the enrollment of the poor in the PhilHealth Indigen program. Yeah, they, they were, the, the local government is supposed to identify the poor and enroll them under the PhilHealth Indigen program. Yeah, they, 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 they identified and enrolled some of the poor, but not all who were enrolled under the indigent program were poor. Some of them were not poor. So it means that, you know, the, the enrollment of the non-poor came only at the expense of the, of the poor. So it is not that they don't know the poor. It is rather that they cannot say no to the non-poor. And uh, I... That, 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 has to be, that has to be considered. The third is that the LGUs can promote the, 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 the other channel by which local government is thought to promote uh, spatial growth or reduce poverty is that the LGUs can promote local economies by incentivizing local businesses. This is a big if. Yes, the LGUs may do that if they have the expertise, willingness, and foresightedness because local development projects or programs happen only after several terms in office. Yeah, these have very long gestation period. It would take a different kind of local government official to sacrifice in the beginning for, you know, for a better uh, development outcome in the future, which may not be credited to him. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a problem, I think. There is also inter-LGU competition that can be expected under a decentralized or federal setup. Ch Chad talked about the need to manage this competi competition in her, in her paper. I think I should stop now. If I go on, I will only reveal further my confusion about what exactly is the question that federalism is trying to answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>